Wait, did did Jim Harbaugh just assemble a better football coaching staff than we had last year? Let's discuss next on this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. But there's going to be one team that's going to play solely as a team. No man is more important than the team. No coach is more important than the team. The team, the team, the team. Looks deep for Anthony Clark. Waits for it. Nip Clark. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, Daniel Payne, you are a Now what? Brady gets terrific. Turns it, get it, touchdown night again. Schultz just before Brazil got him. And a leaping interception by Woodson. Harbaugh back to throw over the middle. Caught by Collinger at the five on his feet. Touchdown, Michigan. On his way. It's good. He's 5'7", 179 pounds. A junior at Michigan. But Jamie Morris packs a wallop. And he delivers for Bo Schindler. And here's your first play. Pressure from second. It is Glenn Steele, number 81, who fought his way through the traffic. Option. And Robinson calls his own number, and he's going to score. Oh, an easy touchdown for Ron Robinson and Michigan. championship again because we're going to play as a team and when we play as a team and the old season is over you and I know it's going to be Michigan again Michigan Go Blue, I'm Steve Dace, and the question on the table with this week's episode is what we just asked as the tease. Is it possible, despite all of the outsider notions of things unraveling, that here on the fly, Jim Harbaugh has actually put together, on paper at least, a better coaching staff than what he had heading into last season? Now, I know this may sound nuts, and it may sound crazy, but... As we discussed on our last episode, Michigan's football coach thrives in the nuts, and he loves the crazy. He is an agent of chaos. And so what may seem like sporadic, erratic, and unraveling to many from the outside to Mr. Harbaugh could very well just be his happy place, his natural habitat. So let's take a look at it. Let's look at each side of the football. Now that Michigan's football coaching staff for this season has been assembled, we think, remember, we thought this at this time last year, and then Mo Linguist, who was originally the co-defensive coordinator, just up and left to take the head coaching job at Buffalo, right? So it is Michigan in the Harbaugh era, so things are never really and totally settled, right? But at least for now... This is the coaching staff that Jim Harbaugh has assembled. Let's start on the offensive side of the ball. So with the offensive coordinator will be Matt Weiss, who it's pretty obvious that Jimmy planned on taking with him to the Minnesota Vikings because that's who he hunkered down with to prepare for that interview. And it's been also pretty obvious that he was being positioned to replace Josh Gaddis when and if he moved on, which he has. He will share... Offensive coordinator duties with Sharon Moore, who only coached the Joe Moore award-winning offensive line in this past season. Uh, And then if you look at, you know, Josh Gaddis was there last year. But again, Gaddis had one good year here at Michigan, and it was a year ago, reverting much to his boss, Jim Harbaugh's philosophy, and away from speed and space. So, I mean, you know, Gaddis had no experience as an OC at all. Coming in here, I I don't know that we can definitively say that that's a downgrade. I also don't think, though, that either Weiss or Moore have the bio to claim that it's an upgrade. To me, that's maybe more of a wash. Quarterbacks coach Matt Weiss will remain there. That's where he was a year ago. Sharon Moore will still coach the offensive line, as he did last year. Mike Hart is still at running backs. He's been given now the title running game coordinator. I don't really know what that means, actually, except maybe it just means an excuse to give somebody more money 
If that's the case, I'm all for it. Uh, at wide receivers, we move Ron Bellamy back to this position after Josh Gaddis coached that position. And you got to think that Bellamy, at the very least, will be as good of, uh, of, a, of a wide receiver coach. And he's going to coach the position full time. And he's every bit the recruiter that Josh Gaddis is. So, again, I think that's a wash. And then you look at the tight ends coach. Now, Jay Harbaugh has done a good job now in two situations as Michigan's tight ends coach. And he's also an excellent recruiter. But Michigan is now hiring up in promoting Grant Newsom, a young man that a lot of people around the pro- around the program have a lot of promise for. You have to think he'd, with his persona, be a dynamic recruiter. So I don't know that on this side of the football you can look at it and say – that definitively this is better than what Michigan had a year ago. But I also don't think you can definitively look at it and say it's worse. I mean, a lot of these guys were guys that were actually here a year ago. I really think this comes down to how good do you think Josh Gaddis was? And frankly, I just don't think he was that good. I think he was good again for one year here, and it's when he essentially reverted to a variation of his head coach and his boss's philosophy and away from his own. So we shall see. But let's look at the defensive side of the ball now, shall we? So the new defensive coordinator is Jesse Minter. He has a profile very similar to Mike McDonald. Now, Jesse's at least coordinated a defense before. He was at Vanderbilt last year. And and I don't think you can really look at Vanderbilt's statistics and glean anything from that. I mean, Vanderbilt's head coach is Clark Lee, who was a celebrated defensive coordinator at Notre Dame. So between Clark Lee and Jesse Minter, if they couldn't dramatically in one year upgrade Vanderbilt's defense, it probably was not upgradable. He will share that position with Steve Klingscale, who contractually gets a much-deserved promotion after the outstanding job he did with Michigan secondary last season. So when you look at resumes, I would actually argue from a college perspective, Minter's resume coming in more impressive than McDonald's. Now, I actually think McDonald's should have won the Broyles Award last year, not Josh Gaddis. I think Mike McDonald, if you understand the way Jim Harbaugh coaches a football team, a, essentially a defensive coordinator is almost a co-head coach. He really delegates on that side of the ball. And so for Mike McDonald to come in here having no previous D.C. experience whatsoever and to see the improvement that we saw on Michigan's defense, uh, he basically saved Jim Harbaugh's job and therefore uh, had a huge say in, in the the incredible season Michigan just had. He should have won the Broyles Award. So based on what we know about Mike McDonald now, you can't – claim this is an upgrade, but based on what we knew about him at this time a year ago, this is a clear upgrade. I mean, Minter is a former recruiter of the year. McDonald didn't really do any recruiting the year he was here at Michigan. So uh, I, I think this is an upgrade from where we were a year ago. Elsewhere on the defensive side of the football, you've got Mike Elston coming in for Sean Nua. Folks, that's a massive upgrade. That's a massive upgrade in terms of technique. That's a massive, even bigger upgrade in terms of recruiting. Elston is considered one of the best recruiters in all of college football, bringing him in from and bringing him home from Notre Dame after too many years there, if you ask me, in South Bend. That's huge. George Hilo, who's a top recruiter, remains with the linebackers. And now you have Klingscale uh, coaching the defensive backs with Jay Harbaugh. Now, Harbaugh, I think, will be a huge plus for defensive recruiting. He might be pound for pound the best recruiter on the Michigan staff. But he's never coached this position before, and we saw this with running backs a couple of years ago. You know, I mentioned before, he has done a good job coaching tight ends twice here at Michigan. In between there, he attempted to coach running backs, and it didn't, you know, it it didn't go very well, actually. Uh, so we're hoping that we get more of the tight ends coach, Jay Harbaugh, than the running backs coach, Jay Harbaugh. But he's got one of the best DB coaches in the country there, and Steve Klingscale to kind of mentor and shepherd him along the way. I, I think on the defensive side, this is overall absolutely an upgrade from where we were a year ago at this time. So on the offensive side, if I think it's a wash, and on the defensive side, I think it's an upgrade. Guess what? I think overall, you could absolutely make an argument that despite – the flirtation with the Vikings and how long this went on and losing both of your coordinators, I think you could absolutely make an argument that heading into the spring, that Jim Harbaugh has a better coaching staff now than what he had a year ago. How? How is that possible, given all of the zany hijinks and, and wacky tobacky behavior? Because he's Jim Harbaugh, and crazy is what he does. Thank <laughs> you.
Time now for the 10-Minute War as we bring in our good friend and perhaps the one and only reasonable bucknut we've ever found. Mark Rogers, the voice of college football, is his channel here on YouTube, and it's outstanding, particularly for off-season information. Good to see you again, Mark. How are you? I'm doing just fine. I'm a little sad that football's completely gone now for another seven months or so, but we've made it for the past 40 years, at least I have. So we'll get there. 170 or so days until a Hall of Fame game there in uh, your home state of Ohio. About 191 or so days until Northwestern and Nebraska kick off the season there. And I think it's in Dublin, Ireland. So it'll be here, brother, before you know it. It'll be here before you know it. Um, let's get to what I opened the show talking about, because I know this is going to sound like balderdash and heresy. But when you lay it out, I think it's entirely possible that Jim Harbaugh ended up hiring a better coaching staff on the fly here while trying to get himself another coaching job, by the way. Um, I, 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 he's just an agent of chaos, Mark. It's what he does, man. That's just if, it, if it's zany, wacky, weird, erratic, that's how he rolls, man. It's just his way. I, I think it is absolutely possible. So let, let's, let's throw these up there on the screen again. You look at this offensively, and a lot of these are the same guys that were here last year in the same positions. So if you look at the offensive side of the football, you've got Matt Weiss still coaching quarterback, Sharon Moore. I mean, this is the number one offensive line in the country last year. You've got Mike Hart still coaching running backs. Uh, you're moving Ron Bellamy over to a position coach position that he's more of a natural for, and he could very well be the best recruiter on the staff. I think you're going to hear a lot from Grant Newsom as a future star. Remember, he's a young man that was on his way to being an All-American at Michigan before one of the worst knee injuries for an offensive lineman you'll ever see. And, you know, I don't think you can say right now that Weiss and Sharon Moore are better than Gaddis. But you know me, I don't think Gaddis was that good. He had one good year here, and it was largely by reverting to his head coach's philosophy. So on the offensive side, I think it probably just comes down to how good do you think Josh Gaddis was. But what do you think? Well, I think with all the zaniness and inconsistency, the one thing that is consistent about Jim Harbaugh that needs to be consistent with any coach that succeeds at high levels is that you surround yourself with a good coaching staff. And so he's been able to do that at Stanford, San Francisco in the NFL, and now with a reset at Michigan, the original staff and the variations of it for the first six years or so were good, but the reset worked and got them to the playoff in 2021. So I have confidence, number one, first and foremost, before dissecting the individual track records and Jim Harbaugh's ability to surround himself with good people and a staff that's going to succeed. Uh, the second thing that uh, we see uh, on both sides of the ball is the Ravens connection. Now, coaching is a fraternity and is always connected to hiring. You hire the people that you're comfortable with, that you know, that somebody else can recommend. That's uh, a thread throughout coaching hires across the country, but not to this degree. So it's a conservative approach to a certain extent, but hey, it, it worked during the reset. And um, I think if you're going to go with uh, an NFL head coach and John Harbaugh, he knows what he's doing. They bring in guys. Shoot, Matt Weiss, uh, before this past season at Michigan, worked uh, there in Baltimore since 2009. Mm -hmm. So just an incredible track record for him. And then in regards to having the multiple roles uh, combining for the coordinators on both sides of the ball, the only thing you need to make sure of there is that they understand their roles. They understand who owns what and that they can work together. I think about Greg Schiano and Alex Grinch at Ohio State, two tremendous minds on the defensive side of the ball, put them together, train wreck, didn't work uh, for whatever reason. Maybe egos clashed, but certainly concept and approach did. So just got to make sure guys on both sides of the ball know their roles. Looking at the defensive side, Mark, I, I think on defense, they clearly have a better staff than what they had at this time a year ago. So if you look at the defensive staff, you look at Jesse Minter. Now, I think the wrong Michigan assistant won the Broyles. I thought Mike McDonald should have won it. Uh, I thought that he saved Jim Harbaugh's job and therefore uh, is, the, is the number one major reason for the springboard season that we just had. But if you look at going into last year, Mike McDonald had no previous coaching experience whatsoever. 
So as we run through the defensive coaches, you have Jesse Minter. He's actually coordinated a defense on the collegiate level. Michigan tried to hire him last year, by the way. Uh, they just He just ended up taking the Vanderbilt D.C. job as opposed to a position coaching job here. You elevate Steve Klingscale, who is one of the better DB coaches in the country, and he earned it with what he did in year one, turning that secondary around contractually. They had to reach certain thresholds for him to get the promotion, and they did. Mike Elston, to me, is a massive upgrade. Uh, I, you know, Sean Nua was a, has has other than last year when he had Aiden Hutchinson, has been really underwhelming as Michigan's defensive line coach. One of the weaker recruiters on the staff. Uh, now you're bringing in a guy who's considered one of the best technician coaches at this position, one of the best recruiting coaches uh, in the country. Uh, I think that's a huge upgrade. You have George Hilo in the same spot. And to me, the question now is moving Jay Harbaugh, who has coached at Michigan, uh, Jim's uh, son. He's coached tight ends and well twice, but then running backs in between. And to, he did that in 2020. That was an unmitigated disaster. Now, if you try to be fair to Jay Harbaugh, maybe that whole season was a disaster and he just got caught up in it. We don't know. But this is a new position for him. Now he does have... Again, a top DB coach there in Clink to kind of mentor him along the way. But from a recruiting standpoint, th- McDonald didn't recruit at all. All right, and you bring in Minter here, who was the recruiter of the year when he was a DC in the Sun Belt. So from a recruiting standpoint, this is a clear upgrade. From an X's and O's standpoint, I, don't, I think it's no worse than even. I mean, Minter comes out of the same coaching tree as you just mentioned uh, that McDonald does. So I think on the defensive side, this is clearly a better staff than they had at this time a year ago. So, Steve, what I like here is the combination D.C. is, again, if it works, guys know their roles, they know where they stand, and they know how to cooperate and uh, work together. You got Clink Scale, who knows the team, knows the personnel, and he's ingrained in the system. Then you bring in a guy with fresh ideas and Jesse Minter. Um, every stop, he has improved the situation. Indiana State. Marginal team, marginal program, marginal defense brought them to a top five level. Georgia State, they had the best scoring uh, points per game defensive improvement from one year to the next under his leadership. The Baltimore Ravens across the board statistically advanced metrics in the secondary during his tenure in 2017 and 18 improved Vandy will push them aside, of course. He, it's a tough go in the SEC, and it was just the one season. So I love the combination with Clink and with Minter in particular. So when you lay this all out, even if you don't agree with me that this is arguably on paper a better staff than they had at this time a year ago, because I mean I think it clearly is, but now, but now the work begins with the spring, right? And so we'll find out. But at the very least, the fact that you are able to put this together in a relatively short amount of time, after losing both coordinators and all of the, un, you know, uh, whatever that was, the, you know, the search for Jim's white whale or whatever we had to do here for the last few weeks, that's a hell of a staff. Whether you think it's better than last year or not, Mark, that's a hell of a staff to put together here in just a couple of weeks coming off of what looked like, frankly, a clown show. And to my first point, I think that is one of the keys to Jim Harbaugh's success across the board throughout his career uh, that doesn't get talked about enough is that, and and that holds true for any successful head coach in the NFL, college football, surrounding yourself with a good coaching staff and understanding who works together, who can do what, and uh, piecing that together and having an eye for talent. And I think he really does. And I didn't give it a much of a thought until I, I looked at this situation that you presented this week uh, with this uh, uh, assembling of a new coaching staff. So then let's take a step back. Michigan starts spring football next week already. We'll do a spring football preview episode here in a couple of weeks. But looking at where things stand right now, do you think there – I think clearly the, the program at the very least lost – positive momentum that it was gaining after the season last year or at the very least saw that momentum put on pause while you know Jim was Jim all right where do you see where do you see this thing trending now I I you know Bill Connolly came out with his first analytics uh for advanced metrics for next year has Ohio State number one Michigan number four one of the things I'll tell you that I'm watching is the recruitment of Dante Moore the five-star quarterback out of Detroit 
Um, his, his, you know, his family's lifelong Michigan fans. He grew up an Ohio State fan, but his quarterback coach is former Michigan coach Devin Gardner. So if you're kind of looking for a bench, you know, an early benchmark here, because everybody has optimism in spring ball, right? His recruitment, he'll probably commit sometime here before the summer. That's one that that's one notion that I'm or benchmark I'm kind of looking at to say, hey, you know, I, will that determine if we've kind of gone back on offense from a momentum standpoint or not? But can you think of other things now that you, if you were a Michigan fan that you'd be looking at over these next couple of weeks, particularly as spring ball gets started? Well, I think the detractors narrative is, of course, Hassan Haskins is gone, Aiden Hutchinson. There's this wave of senior leadership that can't be replaced. And we saw one hit wonder. I don't believe that, but I think there's some level of truth to that. I think uh, we're going to fall somewhere between the two extremes of it uh, continuing to dominate the Big Ten or own the Big Ten. And 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 I don't know that they're going to seriously contend for playoffs in the next few years. And I, I just ranked programs 130 all the way up to number one in the country. I did rank Michigan eighth. Uh, I feel that's where they stand as a program, not a team specifically in 2022, but I think that's uh, where the program sits. I don't necessarily bank on one particular signee as, or commit at this point uh, being something that I'm going to look at, but just the, the the droves of commits and where they lean and where they they commit. But that hasn't been an issue for the most part uh, for this program under Harbaugh. So we bring back, by the way, with numbers that are now finalized, 34 of the 47 players that were on the Orange Bowl too deep, Michigan is bringing back. I know that in your Ohio State world, like every Ohio State website has painted this fantasy that Michigan was a team of 27 fifth and sixth year COVID seniors. That's just not true. 34 of Michigan's 47 players, if you count the specialists, 34 of the 40, that's where the other three come from. So 34 of those 47 players on the two deep at the Orange Bowl for Michigan, Mark, are back for 2022. Yeah, well, that does fly in the face of, of what most people are thinking. Uh, the top end of that group is generally leaving obviously there are key members but th this holds true for every major football program in the country so th so that should not be alarming uh to michigan fans or anyone else so so i get the narrative you're you're spitting out the facts about the two deep and, and again great football programs reload anyway regardless of who you lose you should be able to recover from it and maybe not necessarily cycle up and be a playoff contender every year but uh if you're michigan you should be reloading now, I will mention that this past recruiting class at eighth in the country to Ohio State's fourth in the country, if you believe in the numbers, the aggregate, either the per player rating average or the total point total, that the difference between fourth in the country and eighth in the country doesn't seem like a big deal. It is the same difference as between eighth in the country and 24th in the country. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think for... So there's a drop. Yeah, there is, there is. Uh, the, the key for Michigan has always been to recruit within a certain range and then that you hope that with development and other aspects that go into this beyond recruitment that you can make up a difference, all right? And particularly every few years and you saw that formula work last year, but it's the only time that that formula has worked. Was that an outlier or not? We shall see. I will tell you, looking at Michigan's schedule, Mark, I've never, and we'll talk about this a lot the next six months, I I can't recall Michigan playing a, a, a softer schedule in, in my time as a fan. Like, you know, I mean, this this would take you back to like the, you know, the 70s of the, ten, of the actual 10-year war, you know, where it was just, you know, the non-conference was like Virginia, Navy, and a nobody, and then we'll see Ohio State in November kind of thing. I mean, this this conf this schedule this year, it's just a four-game schedule, really, at Iowa, Penn State, and Michigan State at home, and, and Ohio State on the road. If you just split those games, you're 10-2. and two. You'll be in probably in the Rose Bowl and, and as a New Year's Six, you know, invitee, worst-case scenario. I mean, this, this is a very soft schedule that Michigan's playing. So it will it will help pad some of those numbers. Um, but in the end, you know, these questions will get answered that last weekend in November for sure. Any final thoughts? 
Uh, just basically that uh, the soft schedule can play to your favor, of course, in a win-loss total, but it also can play against you in preparation for a Big Ten schedule. It can also play against a, a bid for a playoff spot. But if Michigan wins the Big Ten, they're in the playoff. That should be uh, pretty well settled uh, right there. It, it should be fascinating. And the scene that we see in Columbus, I know it's a long, long way off, a lot of football to be played, will be similar to the scene that we just saw in Ann Arbor. It's going to be epic because there's going to be blood in the water or so Ohio State fans think mm-hmm. uh, when the maize and blues show up. Great stuff as always, brother. We'll do it again soon. All right. Take care. Thank you so much, Steve. You bet. This week's Twitter poll results, we asked you point blank, will Michigan basketball make it to the NCAA tournament? 54.4% of you said yes. 45.6% of you said no. To me, my answer is four. I think Michigan's got to win four more games in the Big Ten. And and all if you look at Michigan's schedule the rest of the way, pretty much every game is like a quad one game. So I think Michigan's got to win four more games, and I think they're in. If they win three more, then I think they've got to win a couple of games in the Big Ten tournament, including beating one of those top seeds on on Friday. So uh, I think the magic number here down the final stretch, three weeks to go for Michigan, is four. The Wolverines need four more wins. That brings us to our feedback of the week. It's from Ozamataz Buckshank. I love that name. I have no idea what it means. Guys, we have an incumbent who took us to the college football playoffs at quarterback, talking about Cade McNamara. I love J.J. McCarthy, but he has to win the job fair and square. You know that they what they say, though. In the fans' eyes, the most popular guy on the team is the backup quarterback. This is a nice problem to have. I absolutely believe that J.J. McCarthy has to win it on the field fair and square. And I absolutely believe that he will. I just think this is a different level of quarterback. Uh, Cade McNamara will always have a special place in my heart, as he should in all of our hearts, for the season we just had. But it's very clear with the with, that the ceiling for this program cannot be reached with him. Uh, that, that that ceiling has to be reached with J.J. McCarthy. Now, we may be at our ceiling. That's possible. I mean, you know, I've been a Michigan fan since 1983. I've watched us win one national championship. So we may be at our ceiling. And if we are at our ceiling, that ain't a crappy ceiling, man. You know, top five team, winning the Big Ten, you know, I mean, playing in a major bowl, you know, that's pretty much Schimbeckler's legacy here, you know, and he's the GOAT. So we may be at our ceiling, but if you think we are not, then you need a a next level quarterback to get us there. And and I think that next level quarterback is JJ McCarthy. And I think he will show that here. Uh, the next few months as they vie for that position, both in the spring, spring practice in Michigan starting next week, by the way. So this gets underway pretty quickly. And I think you will see J.J. McCarthy assert himself and be Michigan's starting quarterback in September. That'll do it for this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. Don't forget, please, uh, to like, rate, subscribe, share, follow. Uh, Please help us to find whichever one of those applies on your uh, vehicle or platform of watching or accessing our episodes. Please help us to find more Michigan fans just like you, and you can keep up to date on what we think all things Wolverines in between episodes by following us on Twitter at Michigan Podcast. Until the next time. I'm Steve Dace, and go blue.